Hello friends and family and welcome to the August 20th boring meditation stuff. Today I wanted to talk about the dangers of meditation and I think that this is probably a topic worth covering from multiple angles but this actually came up because of this hacker news article that uh, I wouldn't normally have come across but two friends actually sent it to me simultaneously last night and so I did I read through the article and I had a look at some of the comments underneath I didn't read all 254 comments but um, it is interesting to use this as a sort of foundation for a conversation about the dangers of meditation when they uh, should be taken seriously and um, perhaps use the, the community of Hacker News as kind of a lens into one subsection group of people who are either discussing meditation or practicing meditation. So I wanted to start with the um, common frame for the discussion. And the common framework that people often use for a discussion about the dangers of meditation is this and uh, it is definitively incorrect um, there is a, a framing of the discussion in terms of the beginnings of meditation where as a beginner you're extremely unlikely to run into any of the significant dangers of meditation um, and then they tend the people in these discussions tend to um, frame the dangers or the difficulties as something which occur in the middle and then uh, some drastic outcomes. So on one hand, maybe you have enlightenment, but on the other two hands, um, on the other two extremes, you have nihilism and this sense that I am a God, um, God complex in the literal sense, um, self as God. And there's quite a, a cute, <laughs> surprisingly cute Alan Watts story. I can't find it um, at the moment, but where he discusses other meditators who he's meditated with who get into this state, um, this confused state of feeling that they are God, they are con in control of the universe. And obviously, these are both um, incorrect conclusions, um, but this framework um, where these states are placed kind of as end states um, is wrong. So um, nihilism on the one hand, nihilism being this sense that um, the universe doesn't it doesn't really exist or it's all going to end in heat death anyway so why bother any variation of that or the other extreme which a sort of inverts um, an individual and the rest of the universe to the point where um, you feel that as an individual you are in control of the universe or you have created the universe all of this is some sort of figment of my imagination i am god Neither of these states is, um, there's this terminology I'm finding increasingly common in the West, ego death. Um, and I don't use that terminology ever, but um, it, it was frequently used in the comments on, on that article in the Hacker News um, uh, comment section. So I'll use it here. This is not actually ego death. This is not anatta, or um, the English translation of anatta would be non-self and this is not enlightenment certainly um, if you end up in a state of nihilism or a state where you believe yourself to be God you have not found enlightenment um, and so the reframing that we need for these dangers is actually um, this and it's a useful framework it is an old framework uh, it's there in most sects of Buddhism but certainly within um, the ancient texts, Dukkha or Duk, um, is the beginning, this understanding that there are difficulties 
that there are unpleasant experiences, unsatisfactory experiences. This is often translated as suffering in English. Um, that's probably not a sufficient translation, but that's okay. So we have suffering in the beginning. We know that there is suffering. There are discomforts. Um, and then the second stage is anicca. Um, anicca simply means impermanence, and that's a pretty good translation, actually. Um, and the idea that things are impermanent means that they have inherent dangers in them. And anicca really, it really expands um, into quite a lot of things. So our experiences of pleasure, our experiences of pain, our experiences of happiness, our experiences of sadness, our experiences of anxiety, which is what this whole suite of videos is about. This is all within the world of anicca. You do not feel maximum anxious all the time. You are not maximum sad all the time. And because whatever state you happen to be in is constantly changing, um, you end up forming, all, we, we, all humans, end up forming all sorts of unnatural attachments to the states one way or the other. So if we're happy, we get attached to that state and we want it to last forever, but it doesn't. Or if we are sad or anxious or depressed or angry, we get frustrated with being in that state and we want it to go away. Um, the other dangers, um, this self as God, this nihilism, and I'm going to put ego death, this sort of Western terminology, um, that people in the comment section of that uh, website, they, they seemed to repeatedly identify with ego death as though they had somehow experienced it. And that's why I'm using the term here, because ego death then is not enlightenment. If you're enlightened, you're not spending your afternoons on Hacker News complaining about your meditation experience. So um, ego death is not an end state then as it's used there. So all of these difficulties, regardless of how difficult they may be, if they put you in uh, in a mental health ward for two months, as the case with one fellow, um, if you end up in an incorrect mental state, so you believe yourself to be God temporarily, or you end up as a nihilist temporarily. All of these are intermediate dangers. These are not conclusions. And anatta or enlightenment is on the far side of all of these. Um, and uh, th this isn't to downplay the dangers. This is um, the point here is to explain that the dangers are very real. They come in different shapes and sizes um, and they should be respected, but they should not be seen as conclusions. Um, they're always something that's in the way. And there are various ways about dealing with these dangers um, and understanding when and where the dangers might appear. Uh, but first I wanted to take a bit of a sidestep um, to discuss uh, both the New Scientist article that the Hacker News conversation was about and the Hacker News conversation itself. So here, um, all of this ultimately uh, becomes a form of mental masturbation. Um, and here I'm referring both to the New Scientist article and the Hacker News discussion about the article. But um, let's tackle the Hacker News discussion first because it's an unprofessional discussion. Presumably the folks at New Scientist meant that article to be useful, um, but we'll come to that. Um, this form of mental, ma mental masturbation does not get you very far. So um, one comment I saw in particular that, that had a lot of further discussion was that XYZ thing is a figment of the brain or a figment of the imagination or uh, some mental construct. All of that discussion relies on a lot of assumptions. So particularly in the West, but all over the globe now, um, 
we have a strong assumption that the mind, mental contents, consciousness, intelligence is in the brain. And we have a lot of piecemeal evidence to support that, but we don't actually have conclusive evidence to support that. Um, and so if you are taking a strict scientific standpoint, you can't rely on those assumptions. You can't say, oh yes, uh, I understand that the mind is all in the brain, that consciousness is all in the brain. That is unproven. And um, as far as we know, uh, not, not possible to use as a foundation for discussion. Um, so it's, it's worth not doing that. It's worth not making any wild assumptions, even if they're widely uh, held um, about uh, who we are and how our minds work. Um, next, the, I'm cherry picking some examples here, but next up was um, there was a, a lar large amount of discussion in the middle regarding Sanskrit and Pali and the terminology used in ancient literature and how that terminology is translated into English. This was relevant because people were discussing um, the modern approaches of meditation being kind of a quick fix or that's something that you can approach through apps um, or that you can just do here and there a little bit of meditation to make my life better. Um, and, and they were concerning themselves deeply with the translation of Sanskrit and Pali terminology into English. Um, this is, first of all, it's not a worry that you should have, but second of all, uh, it's not possible. It is fundamentally impossible to accurately translate Pali into English. Um, so I'm no Pali scholar, but I know enough Pali at this point to know if you want to understand what the Pali says, learn Pali. That's the solution to that problem. <laughs> You're not going to get better translations, longer translations, um, because the grammar is fundamentally incompatible uh, with English. You can get some very, very good translations, uh, don't get me wrong, but, um, but they will always be lacking something. Um, and if you're looking for the precise meaning, you have to go back to the Pali itself. Or Sanskrit, if, if you're discussing a, a Sanskrit um, uh, derivative lineage of meditation teachings. Um, but again, all of this is, is a form of mental masturbation when you're worrying about these sorts of things, um, but not necessarily meditating. Um, and the third form of uh, this kind of mental masturbation is uh, it is inherently mental masturbation, which is um, that of argumentative philosophy. And on some level, these, um, these other two points and the whole conversation which was happening on Hacker News is a form of argumentative philosophy. And one good example is this question, who is observing? Who is doing the observing? Who is the real observer? And these sorts of questions, what is being observed? Um, they don't really take you anywhere. They might, they might take you somewhere in the realm of philosophy, intellectual philosophy, but that sort of intellectualization can't really bring you to the actual answers of those questions. Um, if you want to know who is observing in a meditative state, Meditate. You, you are not going to learn the answer to that question by reading long lectures uh, or books on the subject. Um, which brings us to um, the segue, which is that only beginners argue. And this isn't to say that, um, that everyone who is making an argument, an intellectual argument or a, a structured literary argument, is inherently a beginner themselves, um, but in that moment, they are a beginner. So monks, when they sit around and argue high philosophies, um, <laughs> as some put it, um, or the discussion of the various canons and translations and things like this, they are returning to a beginner state um, as far as meditation is concerned. 
Um, few few things are so far uh, away from meditation as a, as a, an argumentative discussion about meditation. Um, scholars, similarly, they may be very experienced scholars. Um, they may be very learned in these various languages, but to argue about the texts, to argue about the teachings, is not to follow the teachings. And so you're back to square one the moment you start doing this. The same is true for meditation teachers, monks or, or lay people, either way. Um, if a meditation teacher is arguing with you about what is right, what is wrong, what does this mean, who is the observer, um, they are back at square one with you in the moment uh, of that argument. Such is the case also for scientists. So scientists who are observing meditation from the outside are at square one with you and me. <laughs> they are, they're beginning the discussion, but they can't, um, in the practice of science, take the conversation beyond that. Um, it's, it's fundamentally impossible from the outside, from discussion, um, from uh, a literary or um, philosophical perspective or a scientific perspective uh, to get beyond this beginner state. Um, and then there is, of course, me. I'm having this discussion with you right now. And so this puts me also in that beginner state. Um, as soon as I open my mouth and start arguing these points, I am a beginner. Um, I'm very much a beginner anyway. Uh, even when I meditate, I'm not a very experienced meditator. Um, but I've put a few thousand hours into it, and so uh, I, I don't think that um, when I meditate, uh, it's as if it's, it's not like my first day of meditation. Um, but I'm a beginner on kind of the grand scale uh, relative to monks and meditation teachers, for example. Um, but when I discuss meditation, as I do in all these videos uh, once a day, that makes me very much a beginner. Um, we can only discuss meditation as beginners. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to criticize science here, and I don't want to criticize being a beginner. So science is good in all the ways that we all know that science is good, and being a beginner is perfectly fine. In fact, many meditators will go their entire meditation career all the way up to their death feeling that they are a beginner, and that is perfectly okay. Um, and in many ways, uh, there is a certain openness and a certain um, humility to being a beginner and identifying as a beginner. That's good. But with respect to uh, the science, um, there are two sides here. Uh, one is to get a high level overview of what is going on in the science of meditation. And the other is to go deep on any topics that you find uh, particularly important. Um, as a high level overview, I highly recommend Altered Traits. That's a very good book. It's very well written, it's very well researched, and uh, it's relatively unbiased. Um, it seems to be uh, recently republished as The Science of Meditation. I, I actually prefer the old title of Altered Traits, but um, it's a good book either way. It's by uh, Goleman and Davidson. And um, then once you've read that book, they've actually done meta-analysis of more or less all the science governing the broad topic of meditation, uh, all the, the true science that's been done since um, the 1960s. So you can actually find the white papers referenced from their book. And if you want to get to the meat of the science, you have to read the white papers. Sorry. Um, you can get a good idea from the book, but um, all of this is in contrast to a sensationalist 10 paragraph article from newscientist.com. Uh, worst of all, with a clickbaity kind of title. Um, I, I think that it will always be worth your time to go and read um, 
the, the primary sources for uh, all of this because you, you can't get a summary in 10 paragraphs. You can't get a summary in a single book like Altered Traits. You definitely can't get a meaningful summary from a 10 paragraph article that you read online. And last, once you've read the science and you've come to your own conclusions, I strongly recommend being safe. Um, and a lot of this is, uh, it's, just, it's common sense actually, but it's, it's worth going over. Um, there's a huge merit as there is in any pursuit where you're trying to learn a new skill in having a qualified teacher. Um, <laughs> and this is, it should go without saying, but having a good teacher is uh, often infinitely valuable. And when it comes to meditation and the structure of your own mind, which is the thing that you're trying to change when you meditate, you are much better off with a volunteer teacher. Paid teachers have the wrong motivation, even if they're not paid very much. If you're learning meditation in a yoga studio or if you are learning meditation from someone who teaches meditation exclusively but for money, um, they have a commercial motivation which is inherently dangerous um, because the motivation you are looking for in a teacher is someone who wants to teach you what they feel to be the most valuable thing they know. Um, when it comes to restructuring your mind, uh, this sort of precedes everything else. Whatever you do in life, your mind is involved. And uh, a volunteer teacher can be trusted to at least have this box ticked, that they believe that what they are teaching is so valuable they couldn't possibly charge money for it. Uh, the same goes for apps. So if an app has a financial incentive, it is possible that they will sell you a thing that they feel you are more likely to buy than perhaps those things they believe to be the most valuable. Um, there, there is a, there is a, there is a real distinction here um, between teachers and apps who are paid and um, self-driven education. At least, if you are using an app, especially to begin with or if you are learning from a paid teacher, there's someone on the other side. If your learning process is entirely self-driven, uh, you have no one to go to for help when you actually run into dangers. Um, and so self-driven education is probably one of the more dangerous um, approaches for what it's worth. So these are sort of ordered um, appropriately, but a volunteer teacher is really your best bet. So specifically, I, I talk a bit about Vipassana, although more about Anapana um, in these videos. Vipassana teachers have taken multiple 45-day uh, or longer meditation courses. Um, so if you start thinking about that, that's that they've sat for months, <laughs> months and months in continuous meditation. So they are very serious meditators. They practice the meditation that they are teaching and they, they certainly practice it on the course while you are learning from them. So it is not something that they are selling you. It is not some philosophy that they're trying to get across. It is um, a fairly straightforward practice driven teaching um, it's not it's not the only meditation uh, which works that way but it's the the only one I know uh, with the level of accessibility that um, Vipassana specifically has um, the number two point is related to 
the volunteer teachers. And that is that you should respect their requests. There are two kinds of requests that I, well, okay, three kinds of requests that I can think of um, when, I, when I refer to this. One is when you apply for a meditation course. A 10-day silent meditation course is a serious endeavor, something you should really want to do. It's not something you should do on a whim. And if the teacher replies to you, and if they do not accept your application because they feel that the course may be too difficult for you or because of um, uh, past mental health issues that you won't be able to complete the course or that you may have undue difficulties. Uh, we've been calling them dangers in this video. Um, with the course itself, respect that. Don't apply to another meditation teacher in another location and say, oh, that meditation teacher didn't, didn't like me, but let me try again. Respect the teacher's request um, for you not to do that meditation so that you can avoid those dangers. Uh, similarly, if you begin a course and the teacher strongly requests you to leave the course, you should follow that recommendation or that request. Um, if the teacher wants you to leave the course, you should leave the course. Um, and the flip side of that, the reason I was saying there are three cases, would be if the teacher strongly requests you to remain in the course. So. A 10-day meditation course, silent meditation course, um, in particular, Vipassana meditation courses, they are structured in such a way that um, you're not doing the same thing every day. There is a progression. And um, day seven is different from day nine. Day nine is different from day 10. And so if you leave in the middle of the course, you may cause yourself difficulties uh, that the course can't then resolve for you. So if you have a desire to leave the course because you are experiencing some difficulties or because you've come across some of these dangers, it is better for you to deal with those dangers with a trained teacher than to just give up, go home and try to deal with them by yourself. Because meditation is about your mind, you don't leave your mind at the meditation center. You take it home with you and you have to deal with whatever you were dealing with at the meditation center, um, but now you have no guidance. So number two, respect the teacher's requests, very important. Number three, be aware that not all meditations are equivalent. So this is my complaint about the clickbaitiness of uh, the New Scientist article is that meditation and mindfulness, which are <laughs> completely different things, first of all, um, can be dangerous. Well, okay, sure. Walking down the street can be dangerous. Um, driving a car can be dangerous. Flying in an airplane can be dangerous. But these are three totally different activities, even though they bear some similarities. Um, so I, I would encourage you to research the kind of meditation that you are considering and hear people's accounts. What is that meditation like? Um, what are the effects? What is the technique itself? Ask friends who have done that meditation um, what it is like. What are the consequences? What is the technique? Um, and I've put a few at the bottom of this slide. Anapana and light zazen, as in zazen that you do just as a daily practice. Um, in general, my personal experience is that these are very safe, that you are extremely unlikely to run into serious issues, serious dangers um, by practicing these meditations. This is why I recommend Anapana. Uh, it is taught to fairly young children, um, children as young as um, seven and eight years old. So it's quite a safe meditation. Anyone can practice it. Um, don't push yourself too hard, so don't insist uh, to yourself that for some reason you're going to meditate for three straight hours anapana. Don't do that. Meditate as long as you are comfortable. Um, but these are safe home practices. 
Somewhat less safe or perhaps more difficult would be serious zazen and serious vipassana. So um, these are two other forms of meditation that I've tried. Um, serious zazen would be to go for a zen session, um, which is a seven day silent retreat. And a vipassana course is obviously a 10 day silent vipassana course. Um, you will experience difficulties during that sort of prolonged serious meditation, obviously, and you will be in an environment where you have a trained teacher to discuss those difficulties with. So um, the structure of these courses is often uh, in some ways safer <laughs> than meditating at home. Um, so I actually don't generally recommend meditating on bodily sensations while at home until you've done so with a trained teacher in one of these environments um, because then you'll have some uh, educated trained answers to the kind of um, common questions that come up with the early difficulties in meditation practice and there are there are many different kinds of difficulties right um, there's there's a world of difference between um, a pain in my knee and uh, some experience of a quote unquote ego death, which sends me to a psychiatric ward. So, <laughs> and there are all sorts of difficulties in between. Um, and there are difficulties which are so common that they are addressed in almost every meditation course. Um, you're likely to get a headache at some point. That's a normal thing. And so there are ways to deal with that. I've put one meditation practice in this list, which I have never actually heard anything good about when it comes to people's deep meditation experiences. And that is Kundalini. Um, Kundalini is a yogic meditation practice largely focused on attention directed toward the spinal cord and the length of the spinal cord. Um, that particular aspect of the practice is, uh, it appears elsewhere in other meditation practices, including Vipassana, but it is generally the last step of the uh, overall approach to bodily sensation meditation. And for some reason, Kundalini puts it first and that seems incredibly dangerous. So when it comes to the mind, we know the brain is involved, the nervous system is involved, and certainly the spinal cord is therefore involved. Um, if you start attacking your spinal cord with your attention, it is possible to drive yourself nuts. Um, and I have many anecdotes from people who have either experience this directly or have witnessed someone experiencing this. And I therefore cannot recommend Kundalini meditation any less, to be perfectly honest. Um, it seems like it is uh, fairly common for people to be thrown into these sorts of um, unmanageable mental states. So I would recommend, especially for beginners, that kundalini meditation be avoided. Um, if, if my opinion counts for anything at all there. So there you have it. Um, learn from a qualified teacher, respect the teacher's requests, and research the different forms of meditation that you are considering doing. And then when you do them, go back to step one and learn them from a qualified teacher. I hope this helps. All right, everyone. Uh, this has been a fairly long video. I apologize for that. But I think that meditation safety and approaching the dangers of meditation carefully and gently is very important. And I think that it's a topic worth covering um, repeatedly and in more detail. Um, so I will uh, come back to this in the future when um, perhaps there's been a bit of feedback on this video and I can maybe expand on some of these topics. Um, I hope that this was helpful for everyone. 
Um, I hope that uh, particularly close friends and family are doing at least a little anapana, and um, I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Goodbye.